in and shut up and a seal was set upon him set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations that is the plural for people uh, not thinking of nationality race but rather it's in the plural peoples Deceiving the peoples, meaning all peoples of the earth, no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. I will connect this season up with another event. But this little season was a short period of time compared with a thousand years. Who knows how much time is involved in this short season? At least in comparison, there are two things evident. During the thousand years reign, there was a strong restraining of Satan. And in the short season, there is a release of Satan. Whatever bound him no longer binds him. If we were correct in understanding that the chain was the gospel, the word of God, and the cross, we found that in the 12th chapter, for instance, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. That's repeated over and over again throughout the book of Revelation. Two things, the word and the cross or the blood. These are the binding powers. The blood, the message of the blood is the gospel or the word of God. If that be, if that be the truth, then when people do not believe the gospel, when they do not take advantage of the blood, there will be a release of Satan. Verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And he adds something to this. And shall go out to deceive the nations or the peoples which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. I would presume that it's not a literal battle. The Lord is not engaging in those. He does not need to. This is the closing period of time in which Satan in all fury comes against God's people. This was pronounced in chapter 11 when he said, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth because Satan knoweth that his time is short. Now when he knows his time is short, when that little season comes, and he has little or no time left, he becomes a fiery enemy. Great indignation. So he pronounces a woe and said, Woe to those that are upon the earth, because he hath, hath great wrath. This states that he will gather all the forces of evil to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So the entire world apparently will turn upon God's people. Now this looks like it's a period of time of what's called tribulation, and there could be some involved, in which uh, it appears that maybe the church is being annihilated, but that's not true. There will be a time before there is any annihilation, before there is any uh, destruction of the church, that there is a deliverance from heaven. For Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. The setting is a battlefield. Like a battlefield of those days when they fought in the daytime and they camped at night. So early in the morning, the enemy would rise, dress themselves, and strap on their armor and pick their swords up and surround the sit of the camp of the saints, the Christians, to annihilate them. That's the setting that he has given us. And he said about the saints and the beloved city, not the old Babylon, but the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So that's the way God takes care of the enemy. Now this has appeared twice before. It appeared to us in chapter 11. It appeared in chapter 14. He comes at the right time and he annihilates the enemy. He brings the enemy to an end. There will be the final judgment or the judgment when God judges the enemy. Now he merges from this into chapter 21. We'll notice a significant thing 
that is taking place. Judgment is set, verse 11, white throne, one sitting on the throne, from whose face heaven and earth fled away. So right where earth stands, where men have sinned, where they've been sinning for thousands of years, where their evil deeds have been committed, will be the very spot of judgment. Not on yonder uh, planet someplace, because he said the judgment was set. And heaven and earth fled away. There was no place for them. Because judgment is there. No place for the judgment seat of God and the earth too. And small and great stand before God. The books are open. And another book, which is the book of life. And they're judged out of the books according to the deeds which they have done. Their works. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead. And so it shows there'll be a great resurrection. Now notice how this ties in with chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why? For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. That's what Peter says. Melted with fervent heat, Second Peter chapter 3. Elvis dissolved. So where the earth stands, it seems to me, uh, there is a, a complete, um, there's a complete consummation of these. Uh, elements are, are burned up, are destroyed, are melted. Uh, heaven and earth fled away. Judgment is set. And after judgment is over, judgment passes away. And in this place where the old earth was, both Peter... And John in Revelation tell us there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Peter said, we're into all righteousness. Now, he goes ahead to say that on this new earth will come new Jerusalem, verse 2. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now, the next time we have something to weep about, and we have a tragedy that visits our lives, just remember there's a time when all these tears will be wiped away. We think at the moment that, that we'll weep forever. Uh, we'll never overcome this. We'll never forget it. But there'll be a day when we will. And you know, some of God's saints have had tragedy upon tragedy piled upon them, and it seems there's no end. But if they're saints, there'll be a day when the tears will be wiped away. No sorrow, no crying, no pain. You have pain tonight? You have a hitch in your get-along? It'll be gone someday. No dentist to drill on your teeth. No doctor. We won't have any need for these. Throw your pill bottles away. None of those. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Bodies included. Philippians chapter 3, 20 and 21. He'll change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Wouldn't that group be great? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us the same thing. Our bodies will be changed. Let's hope we get a little better shape. Let's hope we look a little better on yon side. Right, for these words are true and faithful, John. I'm telling you the truth. And he said to me, it's done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Take a look at what he said in verse 2. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. Now he describes it. But you know, before he describes the glory and the grandeur of this city, he has something to tell us about what happens to the ungodly. We just have to throw that in and then dispense with it. The first two sins he mentions are respectable ones. Look at it. Fearful and unbelieving. Full of fear and doubt. Now believe me, these will dog your steps as long as you live. It's easier to be guilty of these sins than it is thievery or murder or smack a man in the face. Because the minute that we set our hand or our mouth or our mind to do the will of God, just that quickly the devil will put fear in us and he'll put doubt. So fearfulness and unbelief are the first two sins that people, that, that will condemn people 
to destruction. And abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, had their part in the lake that burned with fire and brimstone. And there came unto me one of the seven angels that had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. You see, here is one of the angels that told us about the final pouring out of God's wrath upon Babylon, the evil city, the evil woman. We'll talk about it a little bit later tonight. And talk with me saying, come hither, I'll show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. So one of the angels that helped to bring judgment upon the wicked woman is now telling us about the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, I want you people, if you possibly can, to grasp what he is telling us. You know, if I could, if I could say to a young couple, as a realtor, you see, I'd say to them, listen, I have the most beautiful home I have the most beautiful home that you ever saw in your life. And with just a little agreement on your part and considerable effort, you can have it free for nothing. That's free enough, isn't it? Free for nothing? <laughs> it's a short to us. And I'd begin to describe all this and say, well, that has to be the best mansion in the world. But you know, the Bible tells us that that's exactly the way it's going to be. God is preparing a place for us. That's what Jesus said. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a mansion. And you know what the price is? The blood of Jesus and he paid it. He only requires diligence on our part and acceptance on our part. What he requires. And he'll give it to us. Somebody sings a song about just build me a little cabin in the corner of glory land. That all, that sounds like humility, but I'll tell you what it sounds like to me, unbelief. Because he, he didn't go to build a little cabin in the corner of glory land. Sure, I'd be satisfied just to have that, and so would you. Uh, but you know, Jesus does things just right. And he describes this great city. And had a wall great and high. And had twelve gates. And at the gates, twelve angels. And the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Now I want to tell you folks, this is one, has to be one of the greatest and most wonderful things that a person ever saw in his life. You probably will doubt that. Not too many of you have been in Puerto Rico. But if you've ever looked at Puerto Rico on the map, the, the size of this city, just covering the amount of ground, would be equivalent to 640 times Puerto Rico. That's approximately 100 miles long and 33 miles wide. Now that's the amount of ground this great city is going to cover. You say, preacher, I've never been to Puerto Rico. I can't grasp it. You see, I'm one of the sons of Iowa that's always lived in Iowa. All right, it's 25 times larger than Iowa. Does that mean anything to you? The next time you're real tired, you try driving the length or the breadth of Iowa once, and you'll think it's a big state. You multiply that by 25. You see, that's approximately 1,500 miles one way, and 1,500 miles another way, and 1,500, you keep going, four times around it. That would be a long trip. You see, that would amount to 6,000 miles just to take a journey around the city. But he tells us that the, the walls are high, 12 gates, verse 13, and on the east three gates, on each side three gates, verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of 12 apostles of the Lamb. We'll come back to them. And he, talk, and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city of life four square. As high as it is, long and wide. Four square. It is as large as a breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. That's how we have our measurement. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. It's a cube. And he measured the wall thereof, and 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is of the angel. You know, that's tremendous, isn't it? 
three gates on each side. That's large. It's, it's difficult for us to grasp, but now let's just put it like this. We have something like 2,250,000 square miles. That's just the ground that it, that it covers. I multiplied this to come up to cubic. Now, we're talking about miles, not feet, you understand. You, you understand what we're talking about? Miles. 5,280 feet. 3 billion, 375 million cubic miles in that city. I'm not pulling your leg. Figure for yourself. If you, if you know new math, this is old math. Now let's just say we're going to put it in terms of, um, of a skyscraper. Using the generous amount that they usually use, we would have something like 480,000 stories high. We'll need elevators or wings or he's going to have to reverse gravity or something. I don't know what he's going to do. And I don't care. It's going to be done just right. But it's going to be a big city. But he tells us that it has 12 foundations, but 12 does not work out in a cube. Nine will. If you put nine blocks, they, cover, they, they work out to where you, not a cube, I mean a square, to where you have an actual square. Three on one side, three on the other side, but not 12. So it seems probably what he is, he is seeing there, 12 foundations, because this was the way they used to build the buildings. Many of the ancient buildings are built this way, not like we do, not like putting concrete blocks, but their entire building was built upon layers, one upon the other. They found that in their archaeological discoveries, the deterioration of one layer down to another. Now just imagine a city that has 12 layers, one on top of the other, and they're all different colors of stone. And you imagine that each stone is 1,500 miles wide and 1,500 miles long, and I don't know how thick. Tremendous city. Tremendous. I put these down so that we might uh, understand the colors of them. Jasper, it's sea green. Sapphire, fine blue. Chalcedony, must be the most valuable of all, bluish white, brownish white, dull milky color, and yellow and red all mixed. Emerald, bright green, sardonyx, blue and white and red mixed, sardius, blood red, chrysolite, called the gold stone. It's a dusky green with a yellow cask. Burl, bluish green, topaz, pale green mixed with yellow. Chrysoprasus, yellowish green, and mixed with a milky or cloudy color. Jacinth, red and yellow. Amethyst, purple, which is violet with strong blue and deep red. That doesn't mean much to us, does it? But you know, if we had a way of placing those stones in their Real colors, one on top of the other, we begin to see just what the foundation alone was like. Now, you see, this city was seen by the prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 26 and verses 1 and 2. In that day shall this song be sung. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous may enter then may enter in. So this is a city. It's a city that has for its walls, bulwarks, strong. They are called salvation. Many other references to this city, but I think that's adequate. It tells us that it surely must be a beautiful city. Verse 22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Somebody says, what about the sun? I don't know. What about the moon? I don't know. I know we won't have electricity there, no energy shortage. For God and the Lamb are the light. And the city had no need of the sun. Neither the moon didn't need them. 
to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. You see, we're not going to just live in a city, four square. But you see, Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 tells us there'll be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So they'll go in and out the gates. These gates will not be shut. Peter specifically points out that the saints of God will live in the new earth because righteousness dwells there. There'll be no night. If you're afraid of the dark, better days are ahead, friend. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Think of every, everything that's beautiful. The seven wonders of the world and many more. These, of course, will be eclipsed by heaven. But nevertheless, the nations will bring the glory into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. They'll enter the city. Now let's take a pause right here. This is not the end. He goes ahead to show in the next chapter several other items down through verse 2 that will be in the city, such as the streets, the river, the tree of life. Uh, we want to pick that up if time permits. Uh, turning our attention now to the Babylon, which we dropped off in chapter 20. He introduced... In chapter 20, the same kind of an idea which was discussed in chapter 17. This great city, the wicked city, in contrast to this one, called Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and this has a history. I don't have some of my notes here. I don't have all of them for a good reason. I wouldn't have time. There is much on this, but I want to take you tonight back to the time of the flood. There are two things that strike me, and I think they will you too, because Ham was one of the three sons in the ark. Yet Ham was the first idolater. The first idolater. You would have supposed that Ham that could remember the flood. Remember, everyone else was destroyed because of idolatry and other sins. You would have taught him a lesson. But the ironic thing is, he was the first idolater, but he never forgot the flood. History tells us that not only Ham, but his grandson, Nimrod remembered the flood. They knew all about the flood. They talked about the flood. Some of those were alive that knew all about the flood. Direct descendants. Ham didn't die immediately. His shadow cast over two or three generations. But sometimes you can remember the hand of God and still continue in your sins. It's possible. The second thing they didn't forget was the fact that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God said to the serpent, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between Satan and the woman. There would be an enmity between those two and also between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The seed of the serpent, of course, Satanic forces. People who are not Christians. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil and the desire of your father ye will do. What's the seed of the woman? The seed of the woman is Jesus, of course. You'll notice this. That the seed of the woman was going to bruise the seed of the serpent. The head. But the seed of the serpent was going to bruise or bite the heel of the seed of the woman. But here's what he said. His heel. 
Now, his is masculine, isn't it? And it's singular. And that's what Isaiah 7, 14 said. Which is quoted in Matthew chapter 1, 21. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. And he quoted Isaiah. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Means God with us. God among us. The seed of the woman. He quotes Isaiah. This, of course, is referred to similarly in Galatians chapter 3, 16. When he's referring to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He saith, not seeds as of many, but as of one, and of thy seed, which is Christ. That's why we have Matthew and Luke giving us the genealogy of Jesus. Because the descendant of the woman that he had in focus was the coming of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. These people never forgot that. Archaeology has uncovered that. We have a lot of wealth, a wealth of material in archaeology from the history of these nations. Not only Babylon, but the corresponding nations. I read in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and dwelt there. After the flood. They journeyed east. You followed the place where the ark apparently is, and you go east from there, and you'll come to where the Tigris and Euphrates River is, where it deposited a very rich soil in a delta that became later on what is known as Babylon. Now this land was overrun with wild animals. They were fierce. Exodus chapter 23 and verses 29 and 30 tell us the safety of the people were at stake. Now a large powerful man, a third descendant from Ham, uh, came on the scene and his name was Nimrod. Nimrod, he comes in focus later on in the Bible. And Cush, says the text, begat Nimrod. And he became a mighty one. Ham, Cush, Nimrod. Nimrod became a mighty one, notice this, in the earth. In the earth. Not one place. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. You say, that sounds good, preacher. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord, Genesis 10 and verses 8 and 9. Nimrod's success as a mighty hunter became famous among the primitive peoples of that area known as old Babylon. A mighty one in the earth. Nimrod was so powerful and the impression of his achievements made upon the minds of people so great that they found that the whole entire East was impressed with his career. I want to quote to you this given to us in the Ancient History and Bible Light, page 54. Nimrod was so powerful, the impression of which his achievements made upon the minds of men so great that the East is filled even to the present time with traditions of his extraordinary career. Don't minimize Nimrod. Nimrod devised a better plan than simply going out with your bare hands or some kind of an instrument and engaging in a hand-to-hand -hand combat with animals. He said, let's build cities with walls. And the wild animals can't get in. So they surrounded themselves with cities. And I read again the text. And in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erek and Achad and Kelna in the land of Shinar. Genesis 10, verse 10. We well, built the cities. No wonder they thought it was great. They didn't have anything like this before. Now they have walled cities. And the wild beasts do not bother them anymore. Nimrod was an ungodly ruler, though. Never overlooked that fact. It said he was a mighty one. The Hebrew term, term word gibor means tyrant. So it said when he was a mighty one, he was a mighty tyrant. 
That's what the word tyrant means. He was a tyrant. The word Nimrod itself means, let us rebel. So we have even the Jewish encyclopedia uh, given to us in volume 9, page 309, saying, Nimrod was he who made all of the people rebellious. Or the Lord sounds good, doesn't it? As though he's performing in the presence of the Lord and it has the approval of the Lord. But the word before doesn't exactly mean what we sometimes think in front of, before the Lord. But rather he's putting himself before the Lord. In front of the Lord is what it means. And this also carries the hostile meaning to it. And the literal translation is this, against the Lord. See, before or in front of, as though the man is walking in front of the Lord. So the whole history is not that he's performing in front of God and God's pleased with him, but he dares to put himself in front of the Lord. He's hostile. He's a tyrant. He also was a priest of devil worship. Priest of devil worship. He died. How? I don't know. Some uh, evidence tells us that he engaged himself with a lion and the lion got the better of him. But they cut his body up and sent it to all these cities and then shrined this place. They thought they would have the presence of the mighty hunter. But he had a wife and she was the queen of what is known as Babel, and her name was Semiramis, S-E-M-I, like semi, R-A-M-I-S, Semiramis. And, of course, she became the ruler as soon as he died. She gave birth to an illegitimate son sometime later, and she told her subjects that this son was Nimrod reincarnated. Reincarnated. And they believed it. Now we have pictures, by the way. Uh, if you want to look at any standard work, you can find it. I've got a whole bunch here. Um, by the way, on Strong's Concordance, it uh, gives us the idea of that against the Lord, the, the idea that he is opposed to God, and he's opposed to God because he was a priest of the pagans in opposition to God. Now, this son was called Tamaz, and that means reborn. So, Tamaz was supposed to be Nimrod reincarnated. Now, Queen Semiramis claimed her son was supernaturally conceived. Let's put that in here. Supernaturally conceived. An illegitimate son. But she said, this is a miracle. This is done by divine power. Now, here they are in the midst of idolatry, and they're still believing there was a flood, and it was sent by God. That's why they built the Tower of Babel, no doubt because they wanted to have some place of retreat. Why? History tells us that they had written down, they had a great fear of another flood. And some even claim so far as that the reason why they built the Tower of Babel, so that if there was another flood, they'd have an escape. But all the while, they have a fear of God. They are worshiping idols. So let's get a little farther along with this. She claimed the son was supernaturally conceived. Not only was the child worshipped, but the woman, the mother, was worshipped as well. So the golden calf became the symbol of Tamas the son. First record we have, the golden calf. It represented this son, Timos. And that became the sun god through the rest of the Old Testament. Now, since Nimrod was believed to be the sun god, or Baal, that's what he's called, Baal, fire was considered the earthly representative, and thus fire worship entered in, so they had candles and ritual fires in their early performances, rituals. You're going to see a lot uh, that looks just like this over here, from here on. Now, the Apostle Paul, centuries later, said, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. He's talking about this same period of time. Romans chapter 1. When they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. They knew him. But you know, when you know God and you don't glorify him as God, 
You're going to live like a man that doesn't believe in God. Listen to it. They became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image of corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I want you to notice the order of creation. Creeping things and animals, and birds, and man. And when he reversed it, it was man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. God started with the lower form of animal and created to the highest, and man fell from the highest to the lowest. That's Romans chapter 1, 21 through 26. The system of idolatry spread from Babylon to all other nations. Genesis chapter 11 verse 9 tells us. For they were scattered abroad and they took this religion with it. Herodotus, for instance, that world traveler and great historian, in his history book, book 2, page 109, gives a detailed account of how quickly this same concept of mother-son, mother-son, mother-son spread all over the world to all the nations. Egypt, Persia, Phoenicia, and later Greek and Roman. Also, Mr. Bunsen has said the same thing. Many other historians. Let me give this to you. I think it may be of little help to you. He said that the religious system of Egypt was derived from Asia. And we know that from the children of Israel being there. And he said, and the primitive empire in Babel. That's found in Legacy of Rome, page number 245. Now Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, gave birth to a child that she said was supernaturally conceived. Thus she taught God's child. Or Nimrod reincarnated. Or reborn. Now this developed into a well-established religion or worship so that we have numerous monuments in the remains of Babylon of the goddess mother Semiramis and her child Tamas to this day. And you find the very same kind of monuments in all of the countries. For instance, among the Chinese, Mother Goddess was called Xingmu, or Holy Mother. She pictured with a child in her arms. The ancient Germans worshipped the Virgin Hertha with a child in her arms. The Scandinavians called her Disa, pictured with a child in her arms. The Etruscans called Nutria, and among the Druids, the Virgo Peritroi, and the worship of the mother god, it says, mother god in India was known as Indrani, and she was represented with child in her arms. These are all confirmed. This is what has, this is what has created what you know as paganism. It's Catholicism, yes, but believe this. Catholicism simply borrowed from paganism. This didn't originate with the Catholics. They simply borrowed it, that's all. And when he talks about Babylon, he's talking about the composite of all false religions, including Catholicism, the whore, that's the mother of harlots, but a whole lot more than that because he identifies this as Babylon. And Babylon the Great is fallen. Now the Babylonian mother was known as Aphrodite. We find that right now in our pornography language or Cyrus to the Greeks, or Fortuna, the devotees of early Rome itself. The child was known as Jupiter. Do all, do all these sound familiar to you now in the reading of the Old Testament and the reading of history? Eventually, the children of Israel fell into apostasy and they adopted the Babylonish idea of false gods. Baal was one of the outstanding ones. Judges chapter 2 verse 13 reads, They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. They're serving the very gods of old Nimrod. His wife, an illegitimate son. 
Ashtaroth, or Astarte, was a goddess. In Ephesus, chapter 19, we have an account of the great goddess of Diana. You know, when the lucrative advantage that they enjoyed was being depleted, they wanted to do something about the preacher that was depleting it. But all of that passed over, but later on we'll focus our attention upon it. Ephesus, a great mother, was known as Diana, so that the scripture tells us throughout all Asia and the whole world she was worshipped. Acts chapter 19, verse 27. Not just in Ephesus, but it said in all of Asia and the whole world worshipped this woman. Diana. It's right there, chapter 19, verse 27. In Egypt, the Babylonian mother was known as Isis and her child Horus. In 1747, 1747, a religious monument was found in Oxford, England, of pagan origin, which exhibited a female nursing an infant, probably mother and son. And here is what one of the great um, historians had said. Uh, it's in what is called Bible Myths, page 334. And he said, Thus we see that the virgin and child were worshipped in pagan times from China to Britain, and even in Mexico, the mother and child were worshipped. Unquote. Now the Roman Empire, in the times of the Scriptures, the Roman Empire says a noted writer, worship of great mother was very popular under the Roman Empire. Inscriptions prove that the two, mother and child, received divine honors, not only in Italy and especially at Rome, but also in the provinces, particularly of Africa, Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, and Bulgaria. That's what we've been talking about. Now, little by little, the worship of these doctrines were associated with pagan mother and applied to Mary. I mean Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know why? When Constantine put an end to persecution and declared Christianity to be the state religion, he baptized all of his army. They were pagan at heart. He gave them a little prize for it. Down in the river they went, and up on yonder side, and all of a sudden it was called a Christian nation. But only one-tenth of that nation, the Roman Empire, even professed to be Christian before them. So they brought their paganism in, in total. Many are surprised in reading church history to find that in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th, and 6th centuries, the people didn't even bother with the Bible, with the New Testament. The apostles meant absolutely nothing. You know what the rule was? The old Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. Then in the Dark Ages, Platonism, Aristotelianism, they were taught by the Roman Catholic priests as the very foundation and basis and rule of thumb for their doctrines. Read it for yourself. People that don't know church history don't understand this. They didn't even bother with the Bible. They didn't believe the apostles. The New Testament meant nothing to those people in those days because they were heathen. They were pagans with this concept. But what they did was to adopt certain Christian ideas and they just adopted Mary and Jesus in as that mother-son concept. So let's read on. Mary is a mother of Jesus, a fine, dedicated woman, but the Roman Catholics do not worship Mary, like they say. She is considered by them as divine, isn't she? But she never was divine. Jesus was divine, but Mary wasn't. The Catholics say she's divine, just like Semiramis said that the divine power had miraculously conceived Tamaramus in her, 
and this was Nimrod reincarnated, so the Catholics say that Mary is divine and that Jesus is also divine. Well, Christ is divine, but Mary is a fine woman. A fine woman, but she is not divine. The Encyclopedia Britannica states it in volume 14, page 309, that in the first few centuries of the church, no emphasis was placed upon Mary. The first few centuries, no emphasis at all was placed on Mary until finally Constantine declared the empire to become Christian and all the pagans began putting emphasis upon Mary as divine. That's the pagan notion. The early Christians admired Mary. They thought she was a fine woman. They called Jesus divine, but not Mary. Epiphanus, in his day and just before this period of time, denounced certain women of Thrace, Arabia, and other places because they started worshiping Mary as the actual goddess. Where did they get the idea? Paganism. It was creeping in, slowly, but surely. Finally, when the worship of Mary was made official and as a doctrine of the Catholic Church, in 431, guess where it was? Ephesus. I told you we are going to come back to Ephesus. Right back in Ephesus, in the council. The council of Ephesus, the Catholic Church, declared that Mary was divine and was to be worshipped. This is a pagan concept. It exists today. Mary is often called the Madonna. You'll hear Mary called Madonna in this particular season. But this title has nothing to do at all with Jesus of Nazareth. Has nothing to do with Mary. This is a translation of one of the titles of a Babylonian goddess. It is deified form of Nimrod known as Baal. The title of his wife, the female, was Balti, Baal, and B-A-L-T-I. That was his wife. In English, this means my lady. That's what Catholics call Mary. In the Latin, it means Mia Domina. The Italian form of it, Madonna. Now, this is brief. Can you grab what I'm saying here? Roman Catholicism is nothing but paganism, basically. Seventy-five percent of her doctrines have pagan origin and nothing else, all the way from candles to the priestly habits, their practices of incense, praying for the dead, all of that was done by the Greeks, the heroes that died on the battlefield, and they borrowed it. Now, among the Phoenicians, the mother goddess was known as the Lady of the Sea, and thus you'll see there are many terms for this, my lady or Lady of the Sea. The worship of Isis, the Egyptian form of Babylonian mother goddess, was not limited to Egypt. It went from Babylon to Egypt, from Egypt to Phoenicia, on to Persia, on to Babel, the later Babylonia, and then finally to Greece and to the Roman Empire. Isis, the pagan mother god, was worshipped as a shrine and it stood on Vatican Hill, where Vatican Hill is today. That's where it stood. That's where St. Peter's Cathedral is today. The center of the church of mother god. Just the centuries past only. The same title, the same idea from paganism to Catholicism. And the titles, Queen of Heaven, Lady of the Sea, Madonna, Mother God, all of these have their titles applied to Mary, borrowed from paganism. The ancient portrait, for instance, the ancient portrait of Isis and the child Horus, we have those, they have uncovered them in the civilizations, or you call them civilizations, they ultimately accepted not only a popular opinion, he says, but formal episcopal sanction, and it became the portrait, the very portrait we have today of the Virgin Mary and her child. 
So the mother Isis, her child Horus, uh, will be found in the ancient inscriptions of Babylon and Egypt and other countries. The Roman Catholics picked that very same picture up. It's what you oftentimes look at today for Mary and Jesus, Isis and Horus. No wonder God poured out his fury upon these nations and upon the Catholic Church. No wonder. This is terrible. You stop to think about it. We're having to move right along, you know. We don't have any time to waste on this. <clears throat> this Babylon has a little bit more to it. I don't have my encyclopedia here, and I looked and I couldn't find one. It takes a special encyclopedia that is religious knowledge. There are several good ones. Any good religious knowledge encyclopedia, encyclopedia will give it to you. Their knowledge, their, their religion consisted not just in the idea of mother-son, but they practiced drugs. All kinds of drugs. We have new drugs. They had drugs we don't have. It was a drug society. They worshipped demons. Demon worship. Very similar to the practice of the occult today. In addition to that, they worship what is called witchcraft. Not just the demons themselves, but the idea of communicating with demons. That's the mediums, the witchcraft, or the occult idea of communicating with the unseen world. Now everything we have in the world today, from loose sex and morals, which was the worst, you know, in those days... They had terrible orgies in their worship services. They weren't singing praises to anyone, the terrible sinful orgies. No wonder God visited these nations with total destruction. When he destroyed Babylon, he said the city will never be restored. Nobody will live in that city. It was going to be the end. That was ancient Babylon. Now it's the same thing on this one. You know, I'd hate to stand in the shoes of anyone who was in this position, not prepared to meet God. This is Babylon, the great. He said twice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, that great city. We have time tonight just to conclude with chapter 22. He has some important things to say in this chapter. After having finished in chapter 22 the description of this city, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life. It was last in the Garden of Eden. Man failed. He picked it up and put it up yonder in this great paradise, which bear twelve manner of fruits, yielded fruit every month, the leaves of the tree for the healing of nations. You won't need a divine healer to come in for you. You won't need a doctor. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now he describes some of these things in the verses that follow. Verse 7 says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And then we have already noted, he concludes in verse 6, and again in verse 10, the same as he began the chapter. But he has something he has something by way of a warning. Verse 10, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And that's what he said here. That is, the time is at hand for the beginning of the unfolding. And he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. I'm going to tell you something what's going to be like in hell, folks. You know the man that kind of just has his own way of doing things, I'm going to do my own thing, he's going to spend forever and forever in hell doing his own thing. But the man next to him is going to be doing his own thing too. And if you get in his way, he's going to maraud you, he's going to do his own thing. Hell is going to be hell. There's going to be fighting everything you find in the world by way of violence and tumult and strife and greed and batterment is going to be in hell and there'll be no end forever and ever. Let's stop and think of that. I go to the stoplight and I have a way to go. But somebody bluffs me out. 
He dents my car. He beats his horn. He cusses me. And he's on his way. He'll do that in hell, folks. Every man will do his. The man next to him that way. They're not going to be in peace in hell. They're not going to be in rest there. We put that out in chapter 14. But he tells us, there'll be no rest day or night. But the saints of God will have rest. Let's go to the place of rest. Now, he brings a conclusion to this book after having pointed out uh, a few other important things. <clears throat> Verse 18, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues, the punishments written in the book. We don't dare add. We don't dare take away. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book. So we have an opportunity to leave the word of God intact. We don't add to it. We don't take away. So if we don't take away, he won't take away our name out of the Lamb's book of life. We'll have a place there. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. How quickly? He does not say. He has not come. But prophetically, there wasn't to be anything more than what he stated fulfilled. He had predicted every event to the coming of Christ. And so that is quickly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now one thing I want to point out in closing, that we just kind of slipped through here, but it's a good closing. In verse 17, the spirit and the bride say come. Now he's trying to tell us, don't add anything. Don't take anything away. Don't have added to you the plagues of punishments. Don't have taken away from you your name from the Lamb's book of life. The Spirit says, come. He offers a good way. He offers a better way. The way of rest. The way of peace. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is thirst come. Now, if a man has no thirst for God, he's not going to come. I want to tell you something. The first thing that a man has to have he absolutely has to have, if he ever comes to God, is he must have a desire to do right for God's sake. He can go to church until the cows die the trucks, and he'll go to hell yet. What people need is to go through a certain number of circumstances until where they're so tired and weary of sinful ways that there is nothing that satisfies, and they want something to satisfy. We've got a generation of people wanting something to satisfy. Drugs do not satisfy. Sex does not satisfy. It comes and it goes. We've got a generation committing suicide. You know, among the people who commit suicide today, more than 50% of those are youth. Teenagers. You understand that? Teenagers. Why? Because they've lived too long and too much at once. And they're not satisfied. And they think there's nothing else left. But there is. There is. So the man that hears can come. The man that is a thirst. The man that says, Lord, surely there's something better in life than this. I want something better than this. I look back to my days, and you know that's exactly what happened to me. I didn't just say, I'm going to start going to church now. I ought to be a good Sunday school boy. It wasn't that at all, because I'd gone to Sunday school all my life. I had to have more than that. I didn't say, well, I'm going to start singing songs a little better, because I always like to sing songs. I've been doing it all my life. But I found an emptiness in my soul, and I got away and I said, God, let's get this thing settled and squared. And that's what every person has to do. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the man that is a thirst come and take of the water of life freely. No coin, no price. We simply accept it. Number 20 is that great song, Holy, Holy, Holy. We have to thirst after a holy God. We have to say like angels, I want to love this God. I want to serve this God. I know he has everything to offer. I have nothing to lose. We're going to stand tonight and sing all four stanzas. Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty.
should ever take one step, not till I have a thirst for God. It'll be torture all the way. That's what 1 John chapter 5 says.